Um, I just want to say it's great. It really is great to see so many people coming together all for the patient's best interest. And I'm, I'm honored to be here. And I believe we are all truly better together, right? So the information in today's presentation, here's my legalese, is presented for general and informational purposes only. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the boat at all times. This information is current as of today. Tomorrow could be a different story. Just kidding. All right, so we're going to talk about um, Medicare, the big picture. We're going to take a walk back in time, look at where things are at today, and then where are they going, right? This is going to help you. Is everybody in the room patient advocates or are some of you clinical pharmacists? A little bit of everything? Okay. All right, so um, this will help you help your patients understand and navigate Medicare. And know that I'm not joking when I say this. It literally took me 20 years to accumulate all of this knowledge because I feel like it's in a bunch of different places. And putting the puzzle together was not an easy, um, easy challenge. So I want to start by just talking big picture, right? So what is Medicare? Medicare is a health insurance program, right, or an insurance program. But it's really the funder, the payor, right, for patients receiving health care. And I think that sometimes we forget that if health care were affordable, we wouldn't need insurance, right? And know that I'm not advocating for insurance companies. I'm advocating for consumers. But I think it's really helpful to keep in mind what Medicare is, what insurance is, and that it's really just a funding mechanism. So let's talk about some statistics. Um, individual health insurance, sorry, <laughs> individual health insurance is cut off a little bit there. That does not account for much of the population. The employee benefits portion is 55% of the population. 55% of all of us have some sort of um, employer health, employer-based health insurance. 20% um, have Medicare, and probably 10% are direct purchase at individual health insurance through the Affordable Care Act or another program. And there's also TRICARE, VA, and um, health share ministries. But I think that setting the table is going to be really imperative to understand, right, where we're at and where we're going. So as we get into the Medicare conversation, which is where our focus is going to be, I want to just bring some perspective to where Medicare started. So we're going to take a walk back in time, right? Long, long time ago. But during the Depression, um, there wasn't health insurance like we have today, and there surely wasn't Medicare. Medicare didn't come in until the mid-60s. Um, back in Back in the day, back in the 1900s, look at that. We we're having three, four kids, right, per family. Today, we're at 1.93, and that's going to be relevant when we talk about how Medicare is funded and how it's going to be funded in the future. Yeah. Know that some of the stuff I'm going to share with you today isn't necessarily going to be popular, and I sure don't mean for any of this to be partisan, but I do think that we, do, we need to look at numbers because it's not sustainable. So um, back in uh, 1935, right, the Social Security Act was passed in a law by President Roosevelt, and part of that was supposed to be a national, um, a national health care plan. At the time, we were pre-World War II. The Americans did not want to support a national health care program. So it wasn't until 1945 when um, President Harry Truman proposed this to Congress. He viewed it as a human right yada, yada, you can read this. Well, we were post-World War II, right, at this time. So again, didn't take off. Then we had um, 1960, the Curb Mills Act. And that was, uh, I thought that was my song. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. When the Curb Cur Mills Act was passed, it was a forerunner for Medicare. There were three states in 1961, California, Massachusetts, and New York that had most of the enrollees in the system and accounted for 90% of the program's costs. By 1965, only 40 states participated in the Curb Mills program with just 264,000 enrollees. Nobody's ever heard of the Curb Mills, right? Yeah, most of us haven't. Then we have 1965. July 30th, 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law Medicare, a program for what they called elderly Americans. Call somebody who's 65 elderly today and see what happens. I double dog dare you. <laughs> um, at the bill signing, um, which took place, it was actually in the Truman Library. Guess who got the first Medicare card? 
Truman, because he tried to make that part of the Social Security Act back in 1935. Um, interestingly enough, it was an amendment to the Social Security Act of 1935. And in 65, 19 million people enrolled into the Medicare program. Well, what took effect in 1966, but 65 it passed. My great-grandparents, who I actually got to meet in life, were the first generation to be covered under Medicare. Like, how crazy is that, right? It's so close, but yet so far away. I think there's a song about that, but I won't go into that. All right, so let's talk about where Medicare went from there. 1972, Medicare expanded. It expanded to include um, folks under 65 with a qualifying disability and those with end-stage renal disease. Um, if you know anybody under 65 with a disability, they typically have to be on Medicare 24 months. Or I'm sorry, they have to be disabled 24 months before Medicare kicks in on the 25th month. End stage renal disease, that, that's a little bit of a different story. That usually starts the first of the fourth month of your um, dialysis treatments or somebody's dialysis treatments. So then we're going to look to 2003, and this is not all inclusive, right? There's been a lot. There's been a lot of nuances and, and details, but I want to hit like the big things. So 2003, George Bush signed into law. Um, Medicare Part D under the Medicare Modernization Act. Does everybody remember that? There was not drug coverage under Medicare prior to 2003. So 2003, Medicare Part D plans were born. Um, and then 2020, we had the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, which changed Medicare supplement plans in all state, and a couple Medicare supplement plans are retired. Can anyone tell me which two? FNC, good. You guys are good. You're a smart group. If anybody needs a job, talk to me after that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so yeah, plans F and C were retired. And then we've got um, Medicare as we know it today. So let's just kind of talk about that for a minute. Um, Medicare has two parts, A and B, and it's funded in a couple ways. Medicare Part A is funded through payroll taxes. Right. So I got to be honest with you guys before, like when I was 20 and 30 and younger working, I never paid attention to my pay stub. There was a Medicare line deduction. I was, yeah, I didn't pay attention. I just wanted to get paid and go have fun with my friends. So um, anyway, so 1.45% is paid by the employer. That's matched by employees. That was how much was deducted in 2023. Now, remember the population that we looked at at the beginning. We're going to revisit that in a little bit because only 3% of payroll taxes are going to fund Medicare Part A, which is a Medicare trust fund. Then we've got Medicare um, Part B, which is funded through premiums. The premium today is um, $164.90. Can anybody tell me, here's a curious question, in 1966 when the first Medicare policy took, took effect, can anybody tell me how much the Medicare Part B premium was then? Any guessers? $3. $3 isn't that crazy? Today it's, yeah. So today we've got $65. Medicare beneficiaries. We get $905 billion in expenditures. It's the second largest social social insurance program in the U.S. Can anybody guess what the first is? Huh? I heard, who said Social Security? Yep, Social Security is right. Um, and the 20, you know, every year they come out with this Medicare trust fund. Do you guys just wait by the computer looking for that? Okay, go ahead. Tell me I'm a loser. <laughs> okay, so I, I do. Um, in 2023, the Medicare Trust Fund estimated that the hospital insurance fund could start to run short of money in 2031. That's three years later than last year's estimate, so that's a good thing. But Social Security is on target to be depleted a little bit sooner than what was initially suggested. So we're going to be facing some real challenges, right? And um, we'll talk about that in a minute. I don't want to ruin everybody's, you know, recess yet. We're, we're going to talk about what Medicare covers and um, what it doesn't cover and then how to fill those gaps. So when you think of your, think of Medicare, and my kids love this when I, you know, because I just keep it real with them. I got to tell you guys, I don't love doing insurance. I love people. 
this is just my, this is my platform. This is my comedy club. So welcome to the party. Two drink minimum. <laughs> um, Medicare, look at that card and think of a piece of Swiss cheese. I know, weird. The holes in the cheese represent the gaps in Medicare, right? The deductibles, the co-payments, and the co-insurance. Medicare Part A, you see, has some very big holes in the cheese, right? Um, Medicare Part A works on a benefit period deductible when you're admitted into the hospital as an inpatient. Imperative word there, inpatient. Um, the deductible begins, and it's a $1,600 deductible, whether you're in for one day or three days or 10 days or 50 days. $1,600. If you're released from the hospital and readmitted after 60 days pass, that's a whole new benefit period. So sometimes people will ask me, right, like, Carrie, I would never be in the hospital for 90 or 150 days. You wouldn't. You would go in. You would be released. You would re-enter at day 59 for something maybe unrelated, cross into day 60, 61, right, or go to skilled nursing, go back to the hospital. It is possible. Not probable, but possible. Day 61 through 90, the copayment is $400 per day, not per stay. Days 91 through 150, $800 per day. And then beyond that, the patient's um, responsible for 100%. Now, we're going to talk about how we mitigate some of this exposure in a minute. Skilled nursing facility is also covered under Medicare Part A. Skilled nursing facility, the first 20 days. Somebody's in skilled nursing after they meet the three three-day, two overnight requirement, right, with original Medicare. Um, days one through 20 are no cost. They're cost. They're just built into the premium. And then days 21 through 100, it's a copayment of $200 per day. What happens at day 101? You're responsible for all costs. You don't necessarily get kicked off, but you get a big fat bill. Um, Medicare Part B much easier. Medicare Part B is your outpatient stuff. $226 annual deductible 2023. Then Medicare pays 20%. Um, I'm sorry, Medicare pays 80%. The consumer pays 20%. So going back to the cheese analogy, right? The holes in the cheese. Everybody wants to cover their a-holes, right? <laughs> Thanks for appreciating the joke. She told me not to be inappropriate, but I couldn't help myself. All right, so so Medicare covers, right, inpatient, outpatient stuff. There's gaps in Medicare. We're going to talk about how to mitigate that. Before we talk about that, let's talk about what Medicare absolutely does not cover. Medicare does not cover in any way, shape, or form long-term care. Long-term care is different than skilled nursing. Skilled nursing is typically rehabilitative. Long-term care is, hey, I can't do my activities of daily living, and I need help with bathing, dressing, toileting, eating, all that good stuff. So Medicare does not pay for that. Um, if it did, do you remember how much money we were spending? That would be an even bigger number. Um, Medicare does not cover most dental care, eye examinations related to prescribing glasses. And I know that's very specific, but I say it very specifically on purpose because my grandma, my grandparents raised me, so I'm going to talk about my grand, grandma and grandpa a little bit. My grandma has macular degeneration, and when I take her to the doctor every time, she's like, Carrie, Medicare is not going to cover this. And I'm like, no, no, grandma, it's a medical eye condition. It's fine. Medicare will cover this. Um, cataracts, glaucoma, right? We're talking Medicare does not cover, I need eyeglasses, right? More than the dollar store cheaters. <laughs> um, Medicare doesn't cover dentures. It does not cover cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery is a big gotcha. How many of us have gone to the dermatologist and we're like, hey, look at this spot? And they're like, yeah, we'll take that off. They're, we're going to biopsy that. And then they're like, hey, while you're here, you got some skin tags. You want me to take those off? And we say, yeah, go ahead, right? Because like they're you know not really attractive. A lot of times those skin tags are cosmetic surgery. And my my clients get a lot of gotchas with that. They come back at me and they say, you said, and I'm like, no, Medicare doesn't cover cosmetic surgery. Um, the doctor's not necessarily going to say, hey, do you want, Paige, do you, do you want me to move, remove those skin tags? By the way, you're going to have to pay for it, right? They don't give you that disclaimer. Should they tell you or are they, do they 
Yeah, they're supposed to. Right. I mean, I got my colonoscopy and they weren't like, hey, by the way, if we find something, this is not going to be preventative and it's going to cost you $2,500. So you can leave now and go put a down payment on the car. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> but yes, they're supposed to. They're supposed to communicate that. I can tell you going to the doctor with my grandma, going to the doctor for myself, a lot of times it's just, hey, we're going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> I have. I have. Um, hearing aids and exams for fitting them. There was some legislation, y'all might remember, a few years back about adding hearing aids, adding vision, adding some dental care. It didn't, um, it didn't take off. It didn't get off the ground. And then routine foot care. So these things are not covered. So we got Medicare. We got things that aren't covered. We got a lot of things that are covered, but we're going to be responsible. Medicare was never intended to pay 100% of the cost of, of your care, right, or your patient's care. So most people either keep their original Medicare and buy a um, Medicare supplement and prescription drug plan, or they buy a Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare Advantage plans often time inclu oftentimes include Medicare Part D. Medicare Part D is prescription drug coverage. Now, this is from the Medicare and You book but I didn't think it was good enough, so I made it better. Here's what nobody ever talks about. There's these employer retiree benefits. So where I live in the Chicago market, we've got Abbott, AbbVie, right? They provide retiree benefits. A lot of My grandpa worked for a company that provided my grandma with retiree group health insurance until about 10 years ago. So I want to just talk about... The difference between all of these for just a moment in a way that hopefully will not be overwhelming or confusing. So with original Medicare, you keep your red, white, and blue card and those holes in the cheese, those gaps, you fill them with a Medicare supplement plan, also called Medigap, right? And there's different plans. They're standardized by letter, A through N. It's alphabet soup. It's really not fun, um, but it's it's important to know, right, what you're getting. And then because Medicare doesn't cover drugs, you get a standalone prescription drug plan, which we'll talk about those in a minute because I know everybody likes to talk about the donut hole. Um, but Medicare supplement plans, right, you go to any doctor or hospital that takes Medicare. As long as the doctor takes Medicare, they're going to take your supplement. As long as your um, service is on the Medicare list of approved services, you continue with your care. You don't have to worry about a lot of rules. You don't get dental, vision, or hearing. Some supplement plans now have those because they're trying to compete with Medicare Advantage. And then Medicare Advantage, we're going to talk about this Medicare Advantage Okay, we're not going to talk about this Medicare Advantage because this stuff from the employer, that's special. Employers get to design Medicare Advantage plans with special rules. So I don't know if this is true across the country, but I can tell you that people who work for um, like the Illinois Teachers Retirement Program, um, I've helped people in Colorado with their teachers' retirement benefits, the federal program, the stuff that they do for their retirees, it's not off the shelf. Most of us in the room can't go out and buy that, right? Only people who qualify based on where they worked or where their spouse worked. But Medicare Advantage plans, that middle one, that is off the shelf. That's what we. That's what consumers can buy. Care Advantage plans are also called Medicare Part C. I don't know how they got A plus plus D equals C. I don't know how they got that, but Medicare Part C. Medicare Advantage plans vary greatly by county. They vary greatly by state. <laughs> they um, Some of them include extra benefits like dental, vision, hearing. Some of them include benefits for like air conditioners. They'll help pay with, you know, help with utility bills. There's a whole different plethora of Medicare Advantage plans. The first um, session I was in this morning, the, the gal kept on referring to them as Medicare replacement. Um, I don't disagree with that, but I will tell you that every year, this time of year, I have to do this certification stuff. And one of my carriers says, Carrie, you're not allowed to say we're Medicare replacement. So I didn't say it, okay? 
but it does. It takes, when you have Medicare Advantage, you're taking your red, white, and blue card, you're giving it over to an insurance company and you're saying, hey, I want you to manage my Medicare benefits. The Medicare Advantage plan has to do the same or better than what you would get with original Medicare, right? Remember the out-of-pocket costs with original Medicare? You're going to have some out-of-pocket costs with Medicare Advantage. Like the dental, the vision, the hearing that are included in those, let me just tell you, they're network-based, right? So I will have clients, I never tell my clients like, hi, my name's Carrie, it's nice to meet you, I think you should have this. It's more like, hi, my name's Carrie, what's your name? Let me get to know you, let me get to know your needs, let me get to know your budget, because not everybody can afford Medicare supplement plans, right? Not everybody wants to pay for a Medicare supplement plans. I have doctors and lawyers who buy Medicare Advantage plans. I think where the disconnect comes in, and I'm going to quote my grandpa for a minute, the difference between that first option and then that second option, we're, remember we're disregarding the employee benefits, is they're apples and oranges, right? And I think that people who are unhappy with Medicare Advantage plans are unhappy because they buy them thinking they're getting supplement plans or they don't understand that they're going to come with these pre-authorization rules. They're going to have, you know, certain, certain network limitations, right? There's HMO plans, there's PPO plans. Um, there, that's not one size fit, fits all. And I'll be the first to say, you know, I, I don't think either of them are bad options. I think they're both good options. I think the one that's best for the consumer is the one that's going to meet their expectations and their needs the best and their budget. All right. So let's talk about Medicare Part D. And I have to tell you, I don't like Medicare Part D. I don't think it's fun. It's stupid complicated. And I will talk with executives who are retiring. And I just, I'm like, hey, so I don't know how to tell you this is going to be stupid but this is going to be stupid. I'm like, let me just, let me just set the table and set some realistic expectations. Cause you know, they're used to paying co-payments. We all are for our prescription drugs or most of us, right? We're used to paying like $10 for a brand, $50, right? Whatever. With Medicare, you have drug plan coverage stages. Huh? Whose bright idea was this? So some Every Here's what happens. CMS, Medicare says, here's the standard drug plan design. So I'm just going to talk through this for a minute. You've got the deductible stage. The deductible this year is $405. No, $505. You've got the initial coverage phase. Once you meet, meet the deductible, you go into the initial coverage phase. In the initial coverage phase, the consumer and the insurance company are paying towards the cost of the prescription until you reach $4,600 and then you go into the donut hole. Does everybody know somebody who's been in the donut hole? Is it horrible? No, it's not pretty. No. Um, and then once, um, when you're in the donut hole, you're paying 25%. So you still got a coupon, right? You're still going to Walgreens with your coupon, but you're paying 25% of the cost for the drug. I have to remind my clients sometimes. I'm like, yeah, listen, your drug is $1,000. I know 250 sucks, but you're winning, right? I know it's painful, and I will help them find assistance programs. And that's from a little bit different than other insurance brokers, but they're still winning. Then at 7,400, they get into the catastrophic phase. And I don't want to give you all a spoiler alert, but I'm going to talk to you in just a few seconds about um, the changes coming in the future under the current administration with the um, Inflation Reduction Act and how it's going to affect all of this. But that donut hole phase is mostly where people who are on Medicare can get those prescription assistance programs. They're going to have to qualify um, based on each manufacturer has different rules. So um, half of all eligible Medicare beneficiaries are now enrolled in private Medicare Advantage plans. Would you have guessed that? Yeah. So so, like, I mean, just look, right? 2016, 33%. 2010, 20%. I'm just going to say this, and it might not be appropriate, but it kind of defies logic and reason in my mind that we're giving Medicare over to a private health insurance company to manage it, and it's costing 52% or 55% for per Medicare beneficiary, whereas original Medicare is 48%. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, but I didn't go to school for math, but that's, I mean, that's kind of the, it, yeah, but you know what, hopefully they'll get that under wraps 
and start to manage the cost a little bit better. And then we'll see some, some improvement there. It's expected that um, the popularity of Medicare Advantage plans are going to increase. COVID, it kind of contributed to that, right? Because what happened with COVID? Mom and dad weren't leaving the house, right? Or mom or dad, right? There were a lot of um, single, older adults. I don't want to say lonely, but I will tell you a lot of my clients were very lonely. I would call them for one thing and it'd be like two hours later. And I'm like, yeah, okay, so I, I got to go back to work now. <laughs> but I like hearing about your dog. <laughs> Um, but these third-party marketing organizations kind of preyed on that, and they called them up, and they the Medicare Advantage. And people don't know that they have Medicare Advantage, so they go to the doctor sometimes. I'm going to talk about fraud in a minute, too, because that gets me a little bit fired up. I don't like fraud. I don't like lying. don't like cheating. All right, so we're talking about the population, right? We're talking about the Medicare budget, and I want to talk about this because I think Medicare Advantage is going to be the future of Medicare. I think it has to be. Um, and know that just because I say that doesn't mean that I love it or I like it or I want some more of it or I like it, love it, want some more of it. Okay, never mind. I'm from Illinois. I thought coming south I could do a little country music reference and people would appreciate it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, I mean, look at this, right? Look at this trend. Look at the number of workers supporting the number of Medicare beneficiaries. Nobody wants to talk about this, but eventually we're going to have to talk about this, right? Medicare spending in 2025 is expected to be $1.3 trillion. I don't know how many zeros that is, but I think it's a lot. I'm just kidding. I know how many zeros it is. It's it's a lot, but it's, I mean, look at 2015, $648 billion. We're going to $1.3 trillion. And know that it breaks my heart when I hear people who need stuff and they're like, oh, Medicare should cover that. And my heart says yes. My brain says, Ooh, look at that chart, right? That's scary. So the question is, how long can we continue to kick the can down the road? The answer is, I don't know. Nobody knows. This is the third rail. Whichever party, Democrat, Republican, I don't know if there's anything in between that, ice cream sandwich, Whoever says, hey, we got to do something about this is going to be horribly unpopular. And the biggest reason is because guess who gets out and votes? Baby boomers. Guess who's going to be most impacted by this? Baby boomers. And so, I mean, even I have these great conversations with my, my grandma and, you know, she's like, honey, they got to do something. They got to fix that for you. And I was like, yeah, I don't think they're gonna. <laughs> I was like, it's okay. Just so long as it's good for you, grandma, I'll eat dog food. No, I'm kidding. I don't tell her that. I don't tell her that. But here's how they're going to fix it. There, there's either going to be an increase in taxes, a decrease in benefits, or a combination of the two. Right? Mm. So here's what I think happens when they negotiate drug costs. And I'm going to talk about this with the Inflation Reduction Act. You know those balloons that you blow up that are real long and you squeeze them on this side and they get bigger over here? And you squeeze them over here and they get bigger over here? I don't think the cost goes away. I think I, I, if I, that's, I kind of feel like it's just passing the the buck. And know that I I used to think that, I, but I've been doing this for too long to see the game. I'm the legislative chair for my professional association, and it's all about the lobbyists. It's all I, I hate to be a. Hmm, I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to be negative. But let's talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is sort of the negotiation for. Um, negotiation for drug pricing. Drug pricing initially introduced under the prior administration. Biden administration came in with the Inflation Reduction Act. The rebates, if the drug prices rise faster than inflation, we're supposed to be getting a list of those drugs real quick here to see how... Oh, it did. Okay, it just came out last week. 10. There's 10 drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and here's, I mean, I'm just going to keep it real for a minute. Here's how I truly feel is like what they say and what they do. It's always a little bit different, right? Like, oh, I bought that coloring book. I really like it. And I open it up and I'm like, oh, this isn't a coloring book. <laughs> this is National Geographic's, right? It's old enough to remember National Geographic's in this room. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
um, it limits the insulin cost sharing to $35 a month on under Medicare Parts B and D. B just took effect in July. And that's where I feel like they did nothing to reduce the cost of drug manufacture, drug wholesale, drug PBM. They didn't, I, I wish that somebody would go fix, like, like I was always taught, go to the root cause, right? Find the common denominator. And this stuff is fixing it for consumers, but the cost is going to be shifted somewhere else. I don't know where. Um, it does reduce the cost for um, adult vaccines too. So if anybody, if anybody's parent patients needed to get a shingles vaccine a few years ago, they were upset because it was like $200. Now it's covered by Medicare. But you got to go to the pharmacy to get that stuff, the doctor's office, because they're, they can't do it. They, they bill you. Um, 2024, it eliminates. So next year, we're coming up to that catastrophic coverage phase on the Medicare drug plan. That's going to be, the, there's going to be any out of pocket for consumers there. And then 2025, there's going to be a $2,000 cap on Medicare Part D and other drug benefit changes. Now, I was, I don't know if anybody else was in the conversation about um, drug accumulators and maxim. Yeah. So, you know how they were talking about how they just carve out drugs? You guys, the insurance companies aren't going to eat this cost. You know, when I, when I the, huh? The the formularies, the insurance companies are going to change. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. That wasn't clear. What's that? They, yeah, they have already started. I know. Um, but it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse quick um, with with all of this. So, so my son is 19, right? And my son's like, he's starting to work for me a little bit. And he's like, mom, you're like so smart. And I'm like, yeah, I've been telling you this for 19 years. <laughs> and he, his favorite thing is when I say insurance is like pizza. Every time we put a topping on the pizza, we add cost to the pizza, the only thing is the pizza maker doesn't pay for the pizza. Who pays for the pizza? And he's like, oh, I get it. We do. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that's your mom being smart again. <laughs> um, twin, sorry. So 2026, we'll have those Medicare Part D drugs that'll have the, the rebates that rise, rise faster in inflation, and we're going to see more stuff coming. Now, here's what I will say is that somewhere in between here, there's going to be another election. And all this could be undone. All of this could be redone. Um, when I started being the legislative chair for my association, I was so excited. I'm like, I'm going to make it. They're like, no, you're not. I'm like, yes, I am. This was like 10 years ago. So I was a little bit younger. Um, yeah, I was a little more hopeful. That naive. Okay. Huh? I'm going to pass the mic. It's going to turn into a carry roast. <laughs> We've got these other legislative pieces that are also pending. So improving access to Medicare Coverages Act um, that wants to uh, allow observation days to be counted towards the three-day mandatory inpatient stay for Medicare coverage of a skilled nursing facility. If you don't know what that means, it means you have to be in the hospital for two overnights or three days in order for um, the skilled nursing facility coverage to be approved. It's a Medicare rule. It's from a long, long, long time ago. The Medicare Advantage plans don't follow that rule, but I will tell you that Becker's put out a story few months ago that said that they were going to have to start. I didn't get a chance to read all of it yet because all I do is read this stuff and my husband's like, hello. And I'm like, yeah, you want dinner? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's subjective. I got to be honest with you. And let me tell you all this too. So with COVID, do you know that they lifted that, that requirement? Did anybody make a big announcement that they put it back in place? No. You want to know who's upset? My grandma's friends. You want to know who my grandma's friends call when they get upset? <laughs> They're like, Carrie, you need to fix this. I'm like, I'm going to get right on it. I'm going to the White House first tomorrow, Washington, D.C. And we get the Medicare for All Act of 2023. I got not to be partisan about this. Let me just say you can't give more stuff to more people for less money. I saw that. I lived that with the Affordable Care Act. Okay. I would love to have a solution that like makes everybody happy. You just can't give more stuff to more people for less money. Um, the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act of 2023, I would like to be their spokesperson. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hand me a little Debbie. 
Um, and then here's the thing. Remember that with navigating the insurance landscape, right? If we didn't have insurance, we would still have to pay for our health care. Insurance is just a funding mechanism for health care. There's a difference between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Carrie's grandpa says they're apples and oranges. When I was trying to learn algebra, he'd get so mad at me. He's like, X's and Y's, apples and oranges. And I was like, but I like both. <laughs> So original Medicare, Medicare Advantage are different. Consider your patient's health care priorities and be careful recommending a solution. I will have clients come back to me and say, my doctor said that I should have. And I'm like, oh, okay. Does your doctor know what other doctors you're seeing? Does your doctor know? Mm -mm. I'm like, okay, well then why don't you go ask your mechanic what he thinks? I'm not giving them medical advice, right? And and listen, if I didn't think I knew what I was talking about, I wouldn't say it. I know that's not always the case. Encourage them to work with a professional and be careful of scams. I want to share this with you guys real quick. I share this with my clients because I'm in that independent broker, that, that section. But people don't always know that we exist because those stupid commercials, J.J. Walker, mm-hmm, yeah, he was performing at a comedy club in the town next to me. And my husband's like, please don't go embarrass me. And I'm like, I'm going to get all my insurance friends. And we're going to go. Um, when consumers have to buy insurance, they can buy it from an insurance agent. I actually started my insurance career working for an insurance company. All they cared about was sales. You sold two, sell four. You sold four, sell eight. And that's when I was like, I'll never get into the insurance industry again. Hmm. <laughs> sucker. I'm an independent broker. I have a lot of colleagues who are independent brokers. We're part of the National Association of Benefits and Insurance Professionals. When you're a broker, you don't work for an insurance company. You contract with the insurance companies. We're paid a commission. When somebody enrolls in coverage, we're looking out for the consumer's best interest. I will tell you, not all brokers are created equal. But if, if somebody can find a good one, we're, we're worth our weight in gold because we do all the heavy lifting. I'd love to go to an attorney and say, hey, go represent me in court. I'm only paying you if we win, right? Um, consultants, there's a company called I-65 that charges $400 to do what I do for a client. It kind of makes me laugh. I'll have people come in with this report and I'm like, oh, did you pay for that? <laughs> Um, there's call center agents. A lot of them are offshore. Um, there's like Towers, Watson, Aon, Alight. There's a lot of companies. And guess what is else is a call center? Medicare.gov. Did you know that? I was like so devastated when I learned that. I was like, I thought I was calling the federal government. And they're like, well, you kind of are. I'm like, no, I'm not. Where are you located? And then I called back and somebody else was located somewhere else. And then they were like, are you Carrie? We can't talk to you anymore. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's, um, um, yeah. Then there's these um, lead generators. Um, lead gen I hate those commercials. Does everybody hate those commercials? Mm -hmm. Those commercials are lead generators. What they want to do is they want to get your patients, your friends, your parents to call them up and then they sell their name. It's horrible. So tell your, and, and they will do outbound calls too. And they, they start offshore because then they don't have to follow the U.S. rules. So they'll initiate the call and then they'll transfer to an agent and then an agent will whatever pay for the lead or whatever. It's horrible. And then there's, they're called ship counselors in Florida. They're called um, Shine. They're um, government funded volunteers or uh, compensated um, folks that work for, um, I don't know, like the municipalities. And will um, help people. They're not licensed or licensed or insured or bonded. Like I'm, I have to be licensed. I have to. I had to show people that I was smart once. <laughs> Just kidding. I still am. All right. Scams to be aware of. Phone calls. If somebody calls wanting to sell you Medicare insurance, which they call me trying to sell it to me, I'm like, great. What's your NPN? And they're like, what's that? Or they hang up. Emails, check the sender address. And now my grandma's getting texts. My grandma's getting texts like, I can help you with your Medicare. And my grandma's like, did you get a new number? No, grandma, I didn't get a new number. And I just wanted to point this out real quick because these people are really smart. Look at that. It looks like it came from me. It looks like I got a Horizon Benefit Services email. It wasn't from me. It was from this, this schmo, Troy Douglas. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a movie about Troy Douglas. All right, so that's it. 
Um, I'm not, I don't work in every state. I'm licensed in Illinois, Wisconsin, and a few other states. 